boy, we're funny little creatures, aren't we? Mm, just, humans, uh, yes. Uh, it's just I heard listening to Muammar Gaddafi driving in, and uh, mm -hmm. Charlie Sheen, and yep. there's so many, there, there are daily examples mm -hmm. of how we refuse to see what's so obvious. Well, I think those are two really interesting examples of people who, well, they're two interesting examples of how hard we'll work to maintain a positive Im image of ourselves. That even despite a preponderance of evidence that the world does not love us, we will seek out the little tidbits of information that persuade us that it does. And we'll turn a blind eye to all the evidence that says, maybe not. I mean, you, you knew about this, but yet you found yourself doing the same mm. thing, like hiring yeah. like. Well, you see, I think we all imagine, we all imagine that we're better than we are. <laughs> Very we, true. You know, we think we're not biased, other people are biased, but we're not biased. We think our minds have infinite capacity. We think we can work through the night and be just as productive the next day. We think we can drive cars while talking on cell phones. We think we'll notice far, far more than we do. And, um, you know, and the evidence, and, and we also think, you know, that if we're asked to do something evil, that we won't. But the evidence is all against us. Um, the evidence is that asked to do something that, that violates our principles, if asked to do so by somebody in authority, more than 60% of us will. That's a, the button pushing experiment right. with those. Uh, that that goes back to the, what, 50s, 60s? Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about that experiment is partly that it's been repeated endlessly with the same results. So it clearly isn't a function of time or place. But also, I think what's really important about that experiment is that everybody imagines that they'll behave otherwise. We think we are freer thinkers than in fact we are. And similarly, the experiments conducted by Solomon Ash into conformity. If you ask people, you know, how do you think you'd respond, everybody says, well, I wouldn't give a wrong answer, I'd give the right answer. But again, the evidence is against us asked to choose between a wrong answer, which would mean being excluded from the group, sorry, being included in the group, and the right answer, which would result in being excluded from the group, we would rather be wrong than alone. There's a biological, I mean, it's yeah. not that, that we're stupid. It's but, not only that we're stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's not only that we're stupid, but our brains are actually wired. I think the thing that, that's striking, though, is that, you know, in, in many instances of, you know, kind of big disasters, but also personal problems, the common experience people have is, I knew that was the wrong thing to do. You know, a little voice at the back of my head warned me. Why didn't I listen? You know, why didn't I pay attention? And I think, you know, that one of the perhaps lessons of the book is pay attention to that little voice. It's not that you are so stupid it isn't there. It's that you're so stupid if you ignore it. And it isn't that the little voice is always right. But it's always worth thinking, okay, if the little voice were right, what might the evidence be that I'd start seeing? And if there isn't any evidence, well, maybe the little voice is wrong. So that's quite good to know and quite comforting. And if I do start seeing that evidence, well, maybe now I need to do something about it before it's too late. If the little voice is saying, you know, you're spending too much money, then as painful as this is, and I have to say I find it personally very painful. Oh, good. You, know, you have to sit down and go through your bank statements and go through your credit card statements and look at your budget and figure out, am I really spending too much money? And sometimes you discover, well, actually, you aren't. You know, maybe this year you had really low gas bills or something, so actually it's not so bad. And sometimes you discover, yikes, it's really out of control. But at least then you have the data and you can start figuring out how to fix it. As long as you just kind of put your fingers in your ears and sing on the at the top of your lungs, the only thing that's going to happen is the debt's going to get bigger. How do you find feel about human nature when you finish this book? Because I, 
I despaired a bit, I have to say. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess it, uh, it makes me skeptical, but not um, desperate. I think, I think two things. One is, I think that in my experience of running companies, there, the information you need is always there. There is, more, there is more information in the company than most leaders are prepared to surface. If it weren't there, it'd be a real problem, but it is there. It's always there. So that's encouraging because it means it's just a question of finding it. The other thing I'd say that I find hopeful in the book is that the, the characters in the book who change things and who were, if you like, willfully cited they aren't, you know, they don't have PhDs in nuclear physics. They don't have IQs of 200. They don't come from, you know, fancy families or fancy educational backgrounds. They're really very ordinary people. They're ordinary people who have a tolerance for detail and who are fundamentally optimistic. They really do believe they can make a difference. And I look at those people and think, well, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. And I think that's a, that's a very important lesson to learn, which is we all have the capacity to change what we see. And we have the choice about whether or not we release that capacity. The book is Willful Blindness. I've been speaking with the author Margaret Heffernan. And Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril is published by Doubleday Canada.